Unlocking Your Legacy is uh, the title. It seems like our theme seems to be uh, uh, stand up and stand out. And so we, we are uh, sponsoring uh, our Salt and Light Ministry out here. Our Salt and Light Ministry is the ministry of this church led by Robin Hayes. And Ronnie, I don't know how much Ronnie is involved in it. I know Robin is just totally in, in it. And, and th through that ministry, we encourage you, if you're not registered to vote, to get registered. Amen. Amen. Somebody, I've heard all my life, well, my vote doesn't matter. My vote doesn't count. My vote, one vote doesn't matter. Well, you know, I can see how someone could adopt that philosophy in the scope and scheme of things. But when you adopt that philosophy, then you are adopting the idea that you don't matter. You don't matter. And guys, this, this is not good for you, and it's not good for the nation. The Bible said that, that the Bible said we're to stand up and stand out. Well, actually, it says it this way. We're supposed to let our light shine before men and not hide it under a bushel. Amen. Amen. And I believe that that, with many other things, he is saying that, that we should and must step up, get involved, and do our part, contribute, be contributors, contribute our part into life and into what God has planned for you. And I hope that I can convey through the message that I was unable to complete last week. It's so strange. I thought I could say everything in one service, and then I was going to take two. And this morning, already when I got here, I've been visiting with uh, Kip and Henry, and download. The Lord just started downloading things, and I've got half my message prepared for next Sunday, you know? And, and it's all about legacy. You see, it, what matters most is not what you take with you, but rather what you leave behind. The only thing that means more than what you leave behind is what you sent ahead, but make sure you leave something behind. If you leave nothing behind, you've probably sent very little ahead. But what counts is what you've sent ahead and what you leave behind. Don't forget that. Let me pray. Again. Did I pray? I just prayed? I did? Okay. I'm going to pray again. Father, bless the house. Bless the house. In Jesus' name, amen. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And on the earth, God placed man. This is where God told the man to take dominion and to lead. Right here. If you're waiting till you get to heaven to do your part, uh, you're missing God's plan for your life right here and right now. Notice Psalms 40 and 2, the last portion. He set my feet on a rock, and a rock is part of the earth. Okay, I want to clarify this. Now, it speaks both naturally and it speaks of things spiritually and it speaks of things eternally. Jesus Christ himself is the rock, but he also put a rock on this land and he said, the psalmist David said, he set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. Amen. If your only hope is in heaven and and what goes on there, if that's your only hope, you, you really don't have much hope at all. Because if you have no hope in this life and in the things that will transpire here, that should transpire in your life and through your life, if you have no hope for the present moment, what assurance do you have of that which is eternal in regard to things you have not seen if you have no hope in regard to things that you do see, hear, and feel? Now, I know you cannot be guided in and guarded by the things out here that you see, hear, and feel, unless you're guided and guarded by the Spirit of God Himself. And when people begin to download on me all the things that are terrible and nasty and corrupt and are going on in this world generally uh, near and far, then I, I just try to download on them the things that are good and are positive. Our God is still God. He's not dead, and He never will be. Amen. This is where God intends for you to live your life out, to find fulfillment, and to leave your legacy. 
you will leave something behind. Pay attention to this verse of Scripture. I've, I've chosen to read this as the text, Mark 4, 24 through 25. He says, consider carefully what you hear. Now, I could preach for an hour on this and make it all relevant to this day and time. Consider carefully what you hear. If you're listening to fake news and believing fake news, you're going, to, you're going to be confused every time you turn around. You'll go one direction and become afraid and think you need to go another, and then you'll go another direction and still be confused and try going another. So he said, consider carefully what you hear. He continued, with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. So that's whether it's good or bad, with the measure you use, if you use a measure of faith, uh, it will be measured to you and even more. If you, use a, if you listen and use a measure of fear and doubt, it will be measured to you. And he said, even more. And whoever has will be given more. And whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. And we, can, we learned and see a lot of this in the parable of the talents over in in Matthew chapter 25. Guys, be careful how you lead and conduct your life because you are preparing today for what you will leave behind. You're preparing today. What you're doing today makes a difference tomorrow. If you don't believe it, look at your yesterday and see where you are today. And it will prove out that what you do today will make a difference of where you are and what you become tomorrow. Amen? Does that make any sense at all? Praise God. The culture within our nation has changed in my lifetime. It has changed I'm, uh, in every one of your lifetime, unless you're pretty much an infant. The culture within our nation has changed, and America is in trouble today. And we, could, we say that repeatedly. Our nation is in trouble in order to continue being a successful nation, everything will hinge on our stand in regard to biblical values. Amen. This is the prescription God grants in order that we may guide others and also live out a successful lifestyle for ourselves. It is a stand-up and stand-out philosophy that secures eternal benefits and we decided to wear stand up and stand out t-shirts today normally these are the things that we would sell or wear in our christian value summits when we have hosted them uh, around this portion of the country texas oklahoma and all the way over into romania and these these are the this is kind of the philosophy that we try to establish that no matter no matter and, and spiritual things and, and things pertaining to the natural. No matter in, in business, in education, in, uh, in government, in ministry behind the pulpit, we must maintain biblical values. And one of the greatest, uh, how, do, how would I say this? One of the greatest challenges that we have had through the course of these years that as we have conducted our Christian Value Summits around, is establishing them or get in, in pulpits. It is, it is apparent, if you pay attention, it is apparent today that most pastors, and I'm not saying anything to try to glamorize myself because I'm, I'm not going to hold back, and I know others who are not, but it's apparent that most pastors are afraid to speak on or address the issue. And one of the reasons why is most pastors do not take time to search out the issues and find the clarity in order to present it to the congregations. Now, if you were like me, I listened to a portion of Robert Jeffrey's message this morning as he addressed his congregation. I can only assume it was uh, done this morning. Maybe he did it prior, but it was, it was being aired on one of the uh, Christian channels. And he addressed the original intent of our First Amendment that 
that there is a separation between church and state, and he addressed it so thoroughly, so incredibly, showing how the intent in the beginning was that we had a nation based on Christian principles, and he brought the greatest clarity conveying proof even that was granted seven years into this nation by the Supreme Court at that time, the Supreme Court at that time understanding original intent of the Constitution, he brought forth clarity uh, that, that our nation was decidedly determined to be a Christian nation and the freedom given to religion was a freedom given to that which was biblical, not that of every other nation that you can find scattered around the world. Amen. Amen. I know that may shock some because I'm hearing even pastors today attributing the concept that every religion should have the same, uh, what, what is the word? Be held in the same regard as Christianity, but there's only one God. And there's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's Jesus, and it's Jesus only. It's Jesus alone, and no other name. Amen. Praise God. It is a stand up and stand out for Oh, I wanted to say, guys, pay attention. Look at your, your, your television guide on, uh, and see if you can find when Robert Jeffries will come back on later today and try to make a point to listen to his message. I recorded what was left because I, I didn't have time to finish listening to him today. But Robert Jeffries is one, and Rodney Howard Brown, they're the two uh, that I'm aware of more profound pastors that are making statements today in regard to the, to the sovereignty of our nation as being a Christian nation. Stand up and stand out. Now you will never be able to appease Satan no matter what you do. You're not going to make the devil happy. You're not going to go into his crowd and make the devil happy. That's why you must stand up and stand out. He has come to steal to steal kill and to destroy and if you get on his bus you'll travel with him you'll never be able to appease satan or any demon or imp of hell you must seek to please the lord our god ephesians praise god ephesians 6 13 and 14 therefore Put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes and if, you are, if your head has been stuck in the sand or if you're still asleep, I must make you aware the day of evil has come. Amen. So he said, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, standing on that rock, that, that solid place, and after you have done everything to stand, he said, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist. Amen. Stand on the truth. I'm going to read a few things I read last week just to bring you up because I believe it's important uh, in order to continue. Stephen J. Lawson, the author of the book called The Legacy, in these words in the first two pages of chapter one. A few years ago, a team of New York State sociologists attempted to calculate the influence of a father's life on his children and their following generations. In this study, they researched two men who lived at the same time in the 18th century. One was Max Jukes. If you, other than being here last Sunday, has anyone ever heard of Max Jukes prior to last Sunday? Did anyone hear of Max Jukes last Sunday? <laughs> so one was Max Jukes, the other Jonathan Edwards. And if you are any type of biblical theologian, you've, you've heard of Jonathan Edwards for sure. 
The legacy that each of these men left their descendants stands as a study in contrast. They are as different as night and day. And let me read. Max Jukes was an unbeliever, a man of no principles. His wife also lived and died in unbelief. That's why it's very important, men and women, that we share our lives and our faith together and walk our faith out together honoring God and knowing where we're going together to make the greatest difference. Max Jukes was an unbeliever. His wife died in unbelief. Men, that's why you must lead your family and lead your home. Let me find my place. What kind of lasting influence did he leave his family? Among the 1,200 known descendants of Max Jukes were... 440 lives of outright debauchery, 310 paupers and vagrants, 190 public prostitutes. Out of 1,200, almost 200, that's one out of six public prostitutes. And these are all confirmed by documentation. 130 convicted criminals, 100 alcoholics, 60 habitual thieves, 55 victims, victims of impurity, and seven murderers. Research shows that not one of Duke's descendants made a significant contribution to society, not one. Guys, we need to make sure we unlock our legacy. What is your life about? And make sure that there's something carried forth in your life from that. What about the family of Jonathan Edwards? Edwards was a noted pastor and astute theologian. This renowned scholar was the instrument of God, was the instrument of God used to bring about the great awakening in colonial America. And I'll repeat what I, I said last week about Jonathan Edwards. I remember when I was in grade school, maybe it was as, as late as the seventh grade, and I remember in literature we were reading and studying about Jonathan Edwards. And he wrote the message entitled Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. And, and it was profound, and, and it was uh, in literature all through many years, probably that year. It may have been the last, last year they ever had it. I don't know. They keep taking things out of our schools. And, and right now, right now, they are trying to rewrite history in our school books and we need to be praying about these things very diligently. But Jonathan Edwards, when he spoke the message, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God, and he used for an illustration a spider dangling from a web over a flame and over a fire, and just one flame touching the web, the, the spider would fall into the flame and be consumed. And he brought that comparison to the the danger of those who would not repent. He brought that comparison to those who, who were hesitating to surrender, serve, and honor God. He spoke this from an intersection in New York City of that day where, where the, the road split in different directions. It was not just at a, a four-way corner, but in different directions and and they said he was so tired and so fatigued when he delivered this message that he leaned on the pulpit and rested his face, his head, in the cup of his hand and he read word for word as he had written the message out. But it went forth with such power and conviction, speaking to the hearts of men and women, and as though it was amplified, being amplified, resonating between building to building, going down the streets, and 10,000 people gave their hearts to God that day. That day, one message that day. Jonathan Edwards came from a godly heritage. Young people, thank God, if you, if you have a godly heritage, if your parents serve God, if their, their parents serve God, and it goes on and on up the line, thank God for your heritage and make sure you bring forth and deliver a godly heritage as your legacy. Jonathan Edwards came from a godly heritage and married Sarah, a woman of great faith. Together they sought to leave an entirely different kind of legacy 
And among his male descendants were 300 clergymen, missionaries, or theological professors, 120 college professors, and these were men, devout men, back when we had devout college professors. Amen. Can anyone remember that far back? 100, somebody said, I'm offended. I know college professors. Well, if they're not devout, they, uh, you understand what I'm saying. Okay, one, and I know there are some devout. You just have to go near, maybe near and near. I do know near and far. He had 110 lawyers, godly men, over 60 physicians, over 60 authors of good books, 30 judges, 14 presidents of universities, numerous giants in American industry, three U.S. congressmen, and one vice president of the United States. These were in his lineage. He taught men how to live their life out, how to stand up and stand out and live your life out. And that's what I'm asking you today is to stand up, stand out, and live your life out. Somebody said, live your life out loud. Man, don't be ashamed. Don't be backwards in what you believe. And sometimes we are backwards in what we believe because we don't know how to explain what we believe. And if we don't know how to explain what and why we believe, we will probably never leave a, a good legacy. We have to, as the Bible teaches us, be able, always be prepared to, to leave a reason, to give a reason of what we believe and what we hope for. And too many Christians today can't even explain what they believe, and why they believe. And that's why too many Christians today have a hard time standing, just simply standing on what they believe. Amen. Well, God is concerned about you and what you leave behind. And again, guys, this may take me two more hours. I don't know how much time you've got. But there's, I've tried to prepare differently, but I can see I'm getting behind. But, but I'll, I'll, I'll move this. I'll do the best I can. God did not call you just to live an isolated life and it be all about you. Life is not all about you. Even though it does, it's not... Let me say, the sun, moon, and stars do not revolve around you. It revolves around... Revolves around, everything's revolving. Let me explain it this way, maybe. I don't even know how to explain it. This, in order to make you believe everything revolves around you, God had to take where he put you and make it revolve, and then you think everything revolves around you. And that's okay if, you, if it helps enforce the concept of your value and your purpose and, and the good things. But for you to think everything revolves around you, then you think everybody should revolve around you. But God gave you here to revolve around everybody else so that you can make a difference in their lives, whether it's your neighbor, the people in your home, the people in your community, and the people in other nations. God speaks about the nations. And I'll, I, I want to show you Psalms 2 and 8, he said, Ask of me and I will make the nations your inheritance, the ends of the earth your possession. You see, in the, in the Bible, the word church is mentioned less than 80 times. 80 times. Churches, plural, are mentioned 35 times. But nation, nations are mentioned 500 times. And the word nation, plural, is mentioned over 100 times. God is concerned about the nations. And he's concerned about this nation right here, right where you live. And if you think you can get by without being concerned about the nation, the direction of the nation, the salvation and hope of this nation, and therefore you won't even go out and vote doing uh, just a simple obligated duty you won't even satisfy an, an, a simple obligation of your life because you are so conceited or you are so uh, complacent 
And, and, or you just absolutely believe your vote doesn't count and therefore you're convinced that you don't count and you don't matter, then I just want to encourage you to repent from your wicked ways, accept Christ who is the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the King of kings of every king in this world, accept him as your king and make him the Lord of your life and you will find that you have a different purpose and you do matter. You'll never be able to appease the wicked one. Mark 8 and 38 says, If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation. I know he wrote this 2,000 years ago, but it sounds like he's describing this generation. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. If you're ashamed, simply, let me put it in layman terms, if you're ashamed to speak of him, about him, and for him on his behalf, he will be ashamed to speak about you on your behalf when you stand before the Father at judgment. See, some people won't even teach their children their values. If, if you fail to raise your children with your values... They never were your values. Man, I feel divinely inspired to repeat that. If you fail to raise your children with your values, they never were your values. But maybe your values can change. Unlock your legacy. Mark 4, 24 through 25. Con consider carefully what you hear. And I read this as a text. I, I, I must read it again. Consider carefully what you hear, Jesus continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. See, it, that just even goes back to the word. The measure of Scripture that you use in your life will be measured back to you more even more and whoever has will be given more and whoever does not have even what he has if he does not have even what he has will be taken away from him i mentioned a moment ago and i remind you of the of the, the servant who buried his talent and even what he had was taken from him and given to the one that had the most Throw that in the face of socialism where we say take from everybody that has and give to those who does not have. God said I'll take from those who do not have and give to those who have. Somebody said that's not fair. That's not right. That's God. That's God and it's right and it's fair and he's trying to say get something and do something with your life and do not blame others for having something you do not have because you can have everything that God has ever promised to you. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I'll just throw this in before I move along. Uh, legacy began in the Garden of Eden. And Eve failed. Adam, instead of leading, followed. And then Cain killed Abel. What a legacy. Adam brought death in and Cain gave death to Abel. You see, it, it matters how you live. It, it even began in the Garden of Eden. I want to take you over here into Matthew. Maybe I'm moving a little bit faster than I thought I was. Matthew chapter 1, and this is where we read through, and, and I want to remind you this morning the genealogy of, of Jesus from Abraham all the way to Jesus. And so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so. Begat is the word we read in the King James Version. Uh, nowadays we read, and so-and-so was the son of so-and-so, and his son was so-and-so, and then his son was so-and-so, and it just goes down the lineage, a direct lineage from Abraham to Jesus. Let me, be, let me read the first two verses of Matthew chapter 1. It begins like this. This is how the Gospels began. If you think legacy means nothing, this is how the Gospels began. A record of the genealogy. Genealogy is the historical lineage by descent. A record of the gene genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. 
So he's, he skips a couple of things. Jesus was the son of David, and David was the son of Abraham. That don't make any sense to me. Well, over in, in the book of Hebrews, he shows how, and I don't have time to, I won't take time to explain this, the purpose of this, but it does say that, that uh, Levi, the Levites, Levi was worthy of receiving tithe because he paid tithes when he was in the, the bosom of Abraham before he was born, and that was four generations later. Amen. And Levi was worthy to receive tithe as the ministry, the Leviticus ministry. He was able to receive tithe because he paid it when he was in Abraham four generations apart. Legacy, lineage. You see, the, the blessing of God, the, the Bible said the curse will go to the third and fourth generation, but the blessing to a thousand. Amen. To a thousand. And if you, if you lead your children wrong, there will be, there, there's, there's a curse that will go to the wicked three and four generations. But the blessing of the righteous goes for a thousand generations. So Jesus, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. And Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Now, if you study this, when you studied it, you'll remember that, that Tamar uh, was married to one of the sons of Judah. He died, and Judah told her that, that she could have another one of the Sons later, the one son was young. He said, when he grows up, you can marry him, and then you can have seed from this lineage, from this family. Now, there's a whole lot to this story that, that bears many truths. And again, I don't have time to, to preach about that because I'm trying to preach on the value of legacy. But Tamar, seeing after the little boy grew up, that she wasn't getting him for a husband. And, and so... She gave up, she became hopeless, and she devised her own plan, and she deceived Judah. When Judah was on a trip, she deceived him, making him think she was a, a prostitute, and he went into her, and she bore from his seed, and a lineage came from Tamar. Now, that's about all of that story I will tell you. I'm sure it piqued your interest, and you, you should go into Genesis and read about it, and maybe another day I can explain a little more uh, purpose and reason in all of that. But there are only three, three women mentioned in this lineage out of all the women, there are only three women mentioned beside Mary when it comes to Mary, but only three women mentioned in this lineage. And I'm not sure Mary was in this lineage. You see in the book of Luke, there's another lineage, and I'm thinking that's the lineage from Mary that goes up to Abraham, but here it went to Joseph. And so there's only three women mentioned, and all three women had a problem. Let me rush on. So she played the part of a prostitute and in doing so the seed went through her that was going to Jesus okay let me continue Salmon not Solomon Salmon the father of Boaz whose mother was Rahab Boaz's mother was Rahab and Boaz was the father of Obed whose mother was Ruth Boaz's mother was Rahab. Do you all, anybody remember who Rahab was? Well, Rahab was the prostitute that lived in Jericho that protected the, the, the Israelites and the spies when they came to Jericho to, to spy out the land. She protected them, let them down the wall through the window in her house that was built on the outside of the wall, and they escaped. And, and they said, because you did this, they said, when the city falls, you, your house will not fall. And when the walls of Jericho crashed in, killing the multitude, the place where her room was stood still, and her and her family were safe. And she was in the lineage of uh, Jesus. And she was a prostitute, full-fledged, full-fledged. 
Okay, let's go down to Matthew 1 and 6. It said David was the father of Solomon, and whose mother had been Uriah's wife. That, she, they're talking about Bathsheba. David was the father of Solomon. Uh, his mother had been Uriah's wife. That's Bathsheba. And uh, Bathsheba, uh, I won't go into the whole story, but uh, what she did was wrong, what David did was wrong, and she committed adultery, and then David had her husband killed, Uriah, and then they married their first baby. There was a curse. The first baby died because of the sin, and then Solomon came along. Now, uh, I do have to extend the story of Bathsheba just a little bit at this moment. In Proverbs 1 and 8, Solomon wrote the book of Proverbs, Solomon being the wisest man at this time and since, I guess. It said, he said, listen, my son. So he's speaking to his son. Listen, my son, to your father's instructions and do not forget your mother's teachings. He remembered the teachings of Bathsheba. She had sinned. She had committed adultery. She's in the lineage, this lineage, Tamar, Rahab, Bathsheba, all committing sexual sin, and all, all, all in the lineage. Well, let me skip down here. Just to, I, I want to come to this. Matthew 1 and 17, thus. There were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David. You see, he was showing you there's a purpose for giving this lineage. There's a heritage in this. There's a story to be told. And if you'll pay attention, you may not recognize the story that was told before your day, but if you'll do things right, the story can be told correctly from this day, and they'll see there was a purpose. There was a purpose why you were born. There was a purpose why you live, and you shed the light of Christ upon those who were yet to come. So there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Christ. Now, I said all of that to say this, to affirm the first 14 generations, and then I think I can bring clarity quickly in the second 14 and the third 14 generations. But the first 14 generations tells the story of, of the heritage for your life Whereas there was Tamar, Rahab, and Bathsheba who had committed sin and acted sinfully in order to be in the lineage of Christ. Now there was one other woman mentioned, and, and that was uh, Ruth. Uh, Boaz was the father of Obed, and, and his mother was Ruth. This lady was mentioned. Let's, let's settle that down for just a moment. I'm not there yet. Thank you. Y'all are doing what you're supposed to do, but, but let's just be a little bit quiet on that because I'm going over. Uh, you guys are the best, and I appreciate it. Uh, amen. So Ruth was a pure-hearted woman, but she was not born of Israel. She was a Moabite. And so the story you see in regard to all Four women mentioned in this 14 generations tells a story of redemption. Whether they were sinners or outcasts or far away, they were brought in. And the first 14 generations repeatedly tell the story of redemption and the lineage of Christ. Then the second 14 generations is from David the king to, to uh, being carried away into Babylon. And that's the story of the lineage of kings and priests as God has called you to be kings and priests. Can you get this? Can you receive this? Can anyone who says my vote don't count receive this message that God has called us to be kings and priests? And you do count. You do matter. What you do matters. What you say matters. You make a difference. Amen? Amen, I hope this is coming across better than it's appearing from here. Amen. I'm glad, I'm glad these lights are so bright. I can't tell who is asleep and who is awake. Sometimes I can't tell the difference between those with their heads stuck in the sand and those not. <laughs> and then the third 14 generation tells the story from, of the captivity 
to Jesus Christ being the deliverer. And you could say it tells the story of what conveys an uh, assurance and promise because God was there every step of the way, even when they were in captivity. You know, I cannot predict what will happen to the nation before the coming of Christ, but I can tell you a few things of what will take place of this nation afterward. But until then, I cannot, I don't know that I could accurately predict what will transpire in this nation. I think I could predict accurately a few things. But no matter what transpires, God is the God of promise and assurance and if you will dare to trust him and believe him you will go through and it will be all right you'll go through and it'll be all right oh does that mean i'll never suffer pain or or no you may you may suffer death you may suffer a lot of things but if you keep your eyes on jesus you'll go through with eternal crowns and blessings and reward. And the Bible says, Jesus said, your reward will be great. Your reward will be great. Amen. Praise God. I noticed that didn't get as much applause. And I was expecting a standing ovation on that one. But guys, you'll be all right. You trust God no matter what transpires. From the time of the promise granted to Abraham, you guys can go ahead and turn that music up now. I think I made it. I'm 10 minutes late, but I made it. From the time of the promise granted to Abraham, God never forgot and never forsook a single generation, no matter what they were going through. God will not forsake you today. Amen. He has called your generation to be a generation of redemption, a generation of kings and priests, and a generation of promise and assurance. Let me invite you to stand. Thank you, Holy Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father. Thank you for your assurance. Thank you for every promise. Thank you for the blessing at hand. Thank you, sir. Father, I bless this house. I bless this house, each one here this morning. Thank you, sir. I want to speak to young and old alike, but I, I feel like I need to sp be specific toward the young people that are scattered across this room. Never take anything for granted. Maybe two years ago, I seen someone being interviewed on television and asking them about their thoughts for the future of America. And, and the young man said, oh, it, it'll, it'll be good. The future will always be good. And, and they said, uh, they said what, what do you base that statement on? And, and he, said, uh, he said, it's always been good. So he based the concept, it's always been good, it's going to be good. What he did not include was because of the founding fathers and because of the great awakening and because of people's devotion to God it was good but today there's a lack of devotion and people have drifted away drifted away from the truths of the living God and he concluded because it always was it always will be not considering the fact that people may be going a different directions and leaders in our nation are going a different direction today than they were before he said, it'll always be good. Well, I just want to say to the young, take nothing for granted. We will have the grace of God upon us until we're raptured and taken to our eternal home, our eternal destiny. But let's take nothing for granted. Taking nothing for granted, let's endeavor to seek God with all of our heart. Now, there is promise and assurance in Christ. But apart from Christ, there is no Word. There is no eternal word granted from heaven above that apart from Christ there is even a glimmer of hope. I was visiting with Scott back here and Scott was telling me about a, a, a man that he visited with and, and he was so, so headstrong on his confidence in what the government says. And as Scott asked him, why he based his hope in this direction. He said, because if the government doesn't help, 
he said, I have no hope. Well, the young man, or the old man, whatever he was, did not know Jesus Christ. Apart from the government, I have no hope. If your hope is based in this government, but if your hope is based in the Word of God, the grace of God, and, and in the strength of the Holy Spirit abiding in you, living in you, then you have a hope that's profound, steadfast, and eternal. And so I want to read to you this promise. Job chapter 8 verse 7 and 9. Now to some of you country hicks it's the book of Job. But <laughs> in Job chapter 8. Your beginnings will seem so humble. So prosperous will your future be. I received that promise. Your beginnings will seem so humble, so prosperous will your future be. Ask the former generations. See, he's into generations. When you study the scripture, you'll see that he is into generations and he is into nations. Ask the former generations and find out what their fathers learned. For we were born only yesterday and know nothing and our days on earth are but a shadow he said he said we're, we're just young but we go back to the former generations and we ask what they knew we ask what they learned and when you do that and you study history don't let them destroy your history just the history of loan in the nation you'll see how God honored those who honored him and then in the history of the Word of God that's why you need to read the Bible and know the Word of God that is the standard this is the foundation a man and your beginnings will seem so humble, so prosperous will your future be. I am aware that when we preach messages like this, that fear can, can begin to, to gnaw at your heart and consume your thoughts. But God is greater, greater than any negative thought. God is greater than any doubt or deceit the devil can bring into your life. And so I ask you to consider his word, his promise, and his truth. Let's pray a short prayer, then I want to pray another prayer. Father, I bless each one here today. I bless each one here today. Let our hopes and our thoughts be established in you. Let our foundation be you and you alone. Father, we need you. We need you. We hunger after you. We need you. I bless this house in Jesus name if there is anyone here that has never accepted Christ as your Savior and made Jesus your Lord you can do so right here right now at this moment and I would hope that the words that we have spoken would direct your heart and your thoughts in this direction as we've ministered to you things of the past things of today and the future things that the message of eternity the message of hope and the message that you matter and you make a difference but if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior then you can do so right now and the way the only way the way you accept Christ as your Savior is by making Jesus your Lord and you turn your heart to him you render your life you surrender your life you render your life to him making Jesus your Lord if you'd like to accept him as your Savior and Lord, I would like to lead you in a prayer this, this morning, right here, right now. And you can follow me in this prayer and pray this prayer. And Jesus will come in and be the king of your life. And when he becomes the king and the Lord of your life, at that moment he becomes the king of kings and Lord of lords within you. Pray this prayer with me. Heavenly Father, I believe you. You are the God of eternity, the creator of heaven and earth, and you are the lover of my soul. I surrender myself to you. I trust you. I believe that Jesus Christ is your son, your only begotten son, whom you sent to this earth. He came as a baby through a virgin named Mary. He became a man, and he gave himself his life for my salvation. He gave himself so I could be saved. It was the shedding of his blood that has cleansed me. 
The shedding of his blood has cleansed my spirit, my soul, my life. And the stripes he took on his back on his back at that time, the beating on his back was for my healing. I accept Christ as my Savior and my Lord. Father, forgive me of my sin, every one of them. Cleanse me from my shame. Deliver me from all of it. And take away all pain. Separate me from the pain, the pain that that I imposed upon myself and the pain imposed on me by others. Separate me from all that pain. Let me feel and know your love, your grace, your strength. I make Jesus my Savior. He is my Lord. You are my God. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you believe that, give him praise. If you accepted Christ as your Savior, give him praise. He's the lover of your soul. God bless you. We love you all.